I think we'll go ahead and get started here. People can catch up with us as, uh, as we go. I'm John Copans. I work for the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And welcome. Uh, this is the fourth uh, in a series of our opening workshops for the Vermont Community Leadership Network. I really appreciate you all uh, joining us for this. And I want to just share a little bit as we get started to just give a few introductory words. Let me actually run through the agenda for you all to just give you a sense of what to expect here today. Uh, I'll say a few words to get things going. And then I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Danley from the Vermont uh, Farm to Plate Network, who's really going to give sort of a big picture overview from a from kind of a statewide perspective. And then we're going to go right to some great local examples. We've got four different presenters today. Uh, and 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 in a way that really feels like the tip of the iceberg. When we're talking about local food, uh, it feels like there's so much going on across Vermont and, and in Vermont communities that honestly, any, any agenda that we set would, have, uh, would be underrepresenting all the great things that are happening. So we'll hear from our four presenters who will share sort of their story uh, and their uh, examples. And then I think uh, the way we will do this is we'll break out, uh, we will not go into breakout groups, but what we'll do is we'll do a Q&A for folks, uh, for our presenters at the tail end for a little while, and then we'll just kind of transition into an open forum. Uh, I think it would be great um, if folks have other things to contribute to this conversation, whether that's questions or examples of your own, uh, we, we would love to hear those. It, you know, in, uh, this is scheduled as a 90 minute workshop and we think of like that last 30 minutes as just kind of an open forum for, for folks to compare, compare notes and learn from each other. So um, the Community Leadership Network, uh, as I uh, have mentioned, was launched uh, about two months ago and it really emerges from a few different things. It emerges from I, I, from our work at the Council on Rural Development around local leadership. Uh, in the, uh, you know, in 2018 and 2019, we hosted big statewide summits on community leadership. And, you know, given the nature of the work that we do in Vermont's uh, communities, Vermont's small towns around the state, I, I think our core sort of thinking about leadership is that we've got leaders in, in across Vermont and, and to some degree, you're a leader when you say you're a leader and when you step forward to do things in your community. And we feel similarly about this community leadership network, which is, it's not like there's some kind of certification. It's not like there's some sort of membership charge. Instead, we welcome anybody who says, you know what, I want to work on things in my community. I want to make my community and my state better. Well, great. We say, welcome aboard. You're a part of the leadership network. And... Um, you know, as we think about today's topic, I would just, uh, to get things started, you know, when we think about food, it's, uh, it goes without saying that it's so fundamental. You know, it's fundamental to our health. Uh, it's fundamental to our economy here in Vermont. And I, I think about our economy, both in terms of all of the people who work in food production and shipping and marketing of food, but also in terms of like our household economy. You think about how much we all spend as individuals and when we're suffering financially, how, uh, how hard it can be uh, to put food on the table. So in that sense, it's got uh, huge economic implications for us. Uh, it's about, it's about uh, our environment too, in terms of our landscape in Vermont. I mean, think about sort of the picturesque Vermont landscape. And, and often that landscape includes a barn and a field and hay bales. Like so much of what we think about as Vermont is, is connected to our agricultural landscape. And it's also connected to the environment in that it's uh, in, in how we think about climate change and soil health, where we get our food, how we produce our food, how far our food is shipped to get to our table uh, and how it's produced has huge implications as we think about how we live on this planet and how we uh, tackle climate change as, as a real challenge. 
and 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 then when we think about food we think about systems there are, you know you walk into a grocery store or your co-op or your farmers market and like there's food there and you maybe you buy that food but what underlies that <laughs> transaction is an enormous system that I think is invisible to so many of us, right? We just don't necessarily think about all the different steps it took for that vegetable or that uh, box of pasta or whatever it is to go from its source uh, to, to our table. And when we think about the last eight months, I think one of the things that uh, we confront is that we're at this time of systems disruption. Just, uh, and, and that really applies to the food system. I think the pandemic has brought so much into question for us in terms of how we are putting food on the table, in terms of how Vermonters are affording food and food access for Vermonters, uh, how people who are producing food are getting it to market. Uh, maybe they uh, maybe they were a milk producer and they were, you know, the primary market for that was school lunches or they were making uh, cheese and the primary customers were restaurants. We've seen huge disruption over the last eight months in the way we think about food and our food systems. That is both traumatizing for for us in that it's it's hard and uh, and we see families struggling to put food on the table. We see farmers struggling with, um, with finding their markets. But I think we also see some opportunity there in that when that system sort of gets shaken up and flips, um, we see some chances to do things differently. And we see Vermonters doing things in different ways. And I guess a lot of what I see today's conversation about is like, how are, we have this amazing infrastructure in Vermont of people working in this local food movement, movement in so many different capacities. And to some degree, our strength is our power in seizing this difficult moment and trying to figure out how do we come out of it stronger, more resilient with more people sort of putting more, more local food on the table. So that's sort of my, my, my frame up for this conversation. And it's why, you know, as we thought about our workshop top, topics for this first series, uh, local food was right front and center because we, we just uh, appreciate its significance right now. It was always important well before the pandemic, don't get me wrong, but right now it's got a prominence for Vermonters that just feels uh, uh, important uh, to respond to. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to our first speaker. You know, and I, I want to acknowledge for us at VCRD, we are we are the novices when it comes to these topics. What we count on is other experts who we can learn from. And uh, you know, the first person I reached out to in putting this together was San La Sarah Danley from the Farm to Plate Network. She also connected me with a few other thinkers in this that I just wanna mention who I had great conversations with. Annie Harlow from over in, uh, in Addison County, Becca Warren at Vital Communities and Alyssa Matthews at the Agency of Agriculture, all were really helpful in helping think about sort of what we're talking about today. So with that, let me turn it over to Sarah uh, to, to give us an overview. Hey, thanks. That was a great intro. Um, hey everyone, so I'm Sarah. I work at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, which manages the Vermont Farm to Plate Network. So Farm to Plate is a statewide program that was created by the legislature in 2009, and it's actually a statewide strategic food system plan. Uh, which we'll get to a little bit more on that in a second. And the network is made up of over 300 organizations and businesses working together to implement that plan. So while the Farm to Plate Network isn't an organization itself per se, and we work statewide, I do have some resources that I can share for community work. And um, first I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in communities around the state, a lot of which Don has already touched on. So farm to plate is a whole system approach that looks across the entire supply chain from land access and education to production, processing, aggregation and storage, distribution, retail, food access. And we're seeing such a surge in interest in communities this year and doing work all across that spectrum from food access to supporting the future of our farm economy. Most work that we're seeing in communities falls somewhere in the middle of that, tackling food access and farm viability simultaneously 
which is so exciting because that's really important for getting to a robust local food system. Um, but every community is different. So the gaps and opportunities in each individual community might happen at different places in the supply chain. So in many cases, the best place for intervention, um, or at least the most urgent intervention might be right at the point of retail, uh, when a community can help enable an eater to better access local food. I know we'll see some great examples of that soon. Um, but a couple of statewide programs that I wanted to mention briefly are Crop Cash from NOPA Vermont, which doubles three squares Vermont money when it's spent at farmers markets. Um, NOPA Vermont also has a farm share program that subsidizes the cost of CSAs so that more community members can access them while also helping the farm maintain a good customer base and a good income. And then the food bank also has its Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program which allows them to purchase directly from Vermont farms, but they also have a subgrant program where they can grant to smaller food shelves and those smaller food shelves can purchase directly from the farm down the road. Um, so in addition to all of the amazing work happening at the community, I just want to highlight those three as like really awesome programs that communities and farms and individuals should be tapping into. Moving beyond that sort of point of retail, there are a lot of other places of intervention that might be necessary depending on what you're seeing in your community. Storage is a big one. Sometimes there's plenty of food available, especially in areas with good cleaning programs. And there might even be plenty of distribution and meal site partners. And what, what's really needed is the storage and distribution infrastructure in between. And related to that, in some cases, there might also be a need for light processing, such as cutting or freezing as part of that storage and distribution infrastructure. Um, moving even further back in the supply chain, of course, we have the necess necessity of supporting local farmers if we want to have a local food supply. So land conservation and land access, I'm sure you all know, is a really important way to do that. Um, a few other types of work that's needed that I want to mention are, um, many farmers are also in need of processing and distribution infrastructure, like I mentioned before. Many farmers statewide are also really uh, in need of a skilled workforce. There's a huge workforce shortage in the ag economy right now. So if that's true for your community, then you can support your local farmers by developing educational and training programs, or even in some cases by providing other things that potential workers might need, like housing, childcare, transportation. This is a lot of different options for where and how to intervene, but there are a lot of potential partners who can help in your community and they might actually be interested in working on different pieces of it. So I did quickly want to highlight a few sort of types of potential partners and I was really excited to see that I'm pretty sure all of these types of org are represented on this call today, which is awesome. So there are a lot of statewide organizations with a specific food and farm focus, um, but one particularly I wanted to highlight was Hunger Free Vermont which runs many statewide programs, but they also host regional hunger councils. So if you can find the hunger council for your region, if you're not already a part of it, that's a great place to connect with others in your community who are already working on this. Um, the Vermont Department of Health is another great partner. We are going to hear from Megan about a local project um, and they're also invested in food access at a statewide level. And I also wanted to mention other types of healthcare partners. So our state's hospitals really understand the importance of food as medicine, and they also have access to a lot of data that could be really helpful in informing what you want to do in your community. Um, likewise, all of the federally qualified health centers in the state offer some sort of food program. It would be a great place to start a conversation about what they're seeing on the ground in the community. And just a quick note for all of those healthcare partners, um, healthcare partners not only care about food access, but also about the social determinants of health, um, which includes ensuring economic stability for their constituents, which if their clients are farmers, that includes keeping farms viable. So there's a lot of potential for partnerships there. Um, regional planning commissions and other professional planners are also a great place to start. Vermont's planning community is very invested in supporting our local ag economy and food access. And again, there are so many different points of connection there. It could be a conversation about land use. It could also be a conversation about health, which more regional plans are starting to address, or about economic development. And then some of the specific communities that you might need, some of the specific solutions that you might need in your community fit really well within planning topics like transportation, housing, education, utilities, and facilities. So that was a, just a, a really quick uh, run through of some potential types of partners. Um, not at all comprehensive. On the Farm to Plate website, we have a tool called the Vermont Food System Atlas, which you can use to search your own county or town and select filter by types of food system organizations, which is a helpful way to find potential partners near you. 
Um, another resource on our website is if you're interested in sort of what we're seeing in terms of challenges and opportunities statewide, uh, we have a series of two page issue briefs that we've been publishing over the past year and those are also available on our website and I'll pop these links in the chat um, in just a second. It, but in general, my biggest takeaway from what we're working on and seeing at the state level is that these community food system projects are so creative and they're so intersectional. Um, it can sometimes feel hard to find the right state support or the right funding support because the projects are so innovative and so complex. But there is a lot of potential support out there. And if we can just be clear about what stage in the food system we're working on and then speak the right language about it to other organizations who care about it, we can develop some really creative ways of making things happen. Um, for example, in my own community, we have a local food, pro food system project that came out of a, a VCRD visit. Um, our community garden ended up partnering with a local farm. They were then able to get funding through the Agency of Ag with funding from the Department of Health. As the next step, we're getting student support from the Tech School of Business at Dartmouth. So piecing together these different types of support at the right stages for this project can really, really work. Um, and with that like super fast high level overview, I am really excited to move to hearing from the local examples. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. That's great. And uh, definitely um, those resources in the chat will be great too. I think that's really helpful. You know, we often think about one of the first steps as you're launching a local project is kind of that surveying of the scene, figuring out uh, who else is doing things in your community and who are those potential partners. Like those first contacts you make are so important as you get started in something so that you're working in that sort of collaborative way and um, and as opposed to in an overlapping way, let's say, as, as we do these, these types of projects. Uh, next, I want to uh, introduce Megan Harrington from the Vermont Department of Health. And just, you know, huge appreciation. Look, anybody who's working at the Department of Health these days is under a ton of pressure for obvious reasons. So really appreciate Megan uh, uh, agreeing to participate. I know she's got to jump off pretty quickly afterwards, but uh, Megan, it's all you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Excellent, all right, great. Thank you so much, John and Sarah, for the invite today. I appreciate the distraction. <laughs> I would love to talk about food and um, non-COVID <laughs> right now. Um, so uh, I was invited here today to share a little bit about a project we launched last year um, with a small grocer in Bennington. Uh, the grocer is called Willie's Variety, and we worked with them um, kind of a in a few different ways um, and how well the project came together. And they kind of hit my radar um, as one of our big WIC advocate in our community. So um, if anyone's familiar with WIC, it is a supplemental nutrition program aimed at um, prenatal women, breastfeeding women, and kids um, up to the age of five. Um, it's a food benefits package that families receive that includes dairy, produce, um, grains, baby food, baby formula, um, and it's available to anyone who meets in certain income requirements. Um, it's a pretty complex program for vendors to participate in. So you see a lot of um, WIC vendors who are Walmart, Hannaford, kind of the big grocery stores because they have that capacity to, to handle the program. So smaller grocers tend to not participate as, as heavily because they always have to have these certain food items available. So I was really surprised to find out when I started in my position mm -hmm. that we had a WIC vendor in Bennington with a very small footprint, just a small, almost convenience store size um, in a neighborhood um, who was executing the program so successfully that their WIC sales account for 10% of WIC sales in Bennington County. Um, and they're, the, they're smaller than a, a Dollar General. Um, so for relativity, uh, they were outselling Hannaford's in our community with WIC sales. So huge, huge impact. Um, I, after talking with our nutritionists, I found out that the, the women who own this business um, had actually been WIC moms themselves. And when we would have new families join our WIC program, that we would actually, if they were in the, the neighborhood of this store, we would send folks over there because these women were so just, um, inviting to the program. They would walk new families through, let them know what products were available. If they needed special items, they were happy to order them. Um, so, you know, they helped with the retention, they helped with getting people on board and kind of welcoming them to this 
this quick community. So I'm huge advocates of the program. Um, when we went to, I visited the store, um, you know, looking around, they do have grocery items available, but what we found was that, and the layout of their, of their store, that all the produce items are actually like tucked back in the back corner. And it was kind of your iceberg lettuce and some apples and you know, kind of the bare minimum of the items that you would have to supply for to be part of the program. Um, so, you know, we started talking about what it would look like supporting the infrastructure of the store to actually start promoting the sale of produce and, and getting that those item more items available out to our WIC shoppers. And then by default, um, you know, what's available to WIC shoppers is all of, also available to SNAP shoppers and also available to anyone coming in to make purchases. And so, you know, we started looking at the store and actually around the same time, um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of um, the Mellon grant through Bennington College, but this is a huge um, uh, grant oppor opportunity that was made available to Bennington College. It was a million dollars to address food insecurity in the area. And part of that money was actually uh, funds available to the community for projects addressing food insecurity. So there was $15,000 made available to small community organizations last year. Um, we helped Willie's submit an application uh, for $5,000 for a new produce cooler um, through that, those funds. And so, you know, what we were able to do is look at their space um, and connect them with these resources. Um, they ended up purchasing a new produce cooler. And I wish I had the before and after pictures to share with you all because it's just so striking. Um, the space that they picked um, actually was holding this like giant uh, ice, um, you know, the, the big boxes that hold the big 10 pound bags of ice. And above that was a camel lights clock from like 1985. So like if you could picture that. And then what ended up going into that space was this beautiful reach in produce cooler, um, produce stands that they were, you know, everything purchased with this funds through the, the Mellon Grant Foundation. Um, and, you know, the sisters were in charge of this whole project. It was, it was their initiative. They made the purchases. They made, you know, it was their, their vision for what they saw. And um, we were just there, you know, connecting resources and offering support through that process. Um, the last time I spoke uh, with, with the owners of Willie's Variety, they reported that produce sales had tripled in their store and that they were beginning to offer local items. So there was actually someone uh, in the neighborhood who had started growing microgreens. And so they started sourcing microgreens from this local grower. And now they sell out of microgreens every week and they're in such high demand. Um, and what this has also resulted in is other items um, being sourced from local, local producers. So, you know, they used to carry a couple pack, uh, pounds of ground beef from a local farm in Pownal um, that has expanded out to, you know, two shells of, of different varieties and beef and pork and other items as well. So, they're, and if you see their Facebook page too, they're, they're very proud of this initiative and they're highlighting their local partners and they're highlighting their produce. And um, it's, it's been really amazing to see, you know, what was a, a giant ice box and a camel light clock turn into, you know, this, this really amazing project that for a, you know, pretty low investment, like $5,000 actually turns into a much bigger project than that. Um, you know, I think what I've chatted with Sarah, you know, about, about is that, you know, sometimes smaller retailers um, and that world, and when you were talking about kind of the, the food system and, and supply, sometimes gets overlooked a little bit. It's not the sexiest part of our food system. And so I think, you know, focusing in on these kind of small investments and in our small business owners and, and how they're able to offer um, out the products that we would love to get into the hands of people who live here um, is kind of that missing, is that missing piece. And so, um, when we pitched the Willie's project to the Mellon Grant folks, um, you know, we, we really uh, posed it as a pilot mm -hmm. and that we would love to continue to seek out these smaller investments for our small grocers mm -hmm. and see if it, you know, works in other areas, um, a more rural setting versus a, a walkable retail space. Um, you know, someone with even more limited space, a reach-in cooler is an, um, an option for a lot of, a lot of smaller grocers. So kind of playing around with what the model looks like and, and seeing where those small investments um, can make a big impact. Uh, let's see, what have I missed? <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. 
Thank, uh, thanks, Megan. You know, I know Megan has to run. So if anyone has some qu a quick question that you wanted to ask Megan before she does that, I know we're breaking from our schedule a little bit, but because she's got to go. Uh, yeah, I anyone... do appreciate that. Yeah. yeah and, if, and, and please feel free to contact me with any questions. I know Sarah and John both have my email as well, but I'm happy to answer any questions right now. As well. uh, you could just wave, wave a hand or unmute and, and talk if anyone has questions. Otherwise, we will, uh, we will move along. Megan, can you just put your email in the chat? Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Megan. Oh. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Great. Uh, you know, over in Addison County, there is a great organization uh, that is called the, I think I'm getting this right, the Addison County uh, Reloc Relocalization Network. And uh, Lindsey Burke does, uh, it, it, First of all, ACORN does an amazing amount of things, and Lindsay is uh, a leader in a lot of that work. So uh, I want to introduce Lindsay. It's all yours. Hi. Th thanks, John. Thanks for inviting us to be here. Thanks to, for inviting me to be here. I'm going to share my screen because I have a lot of information to cover, and I think some visuals sometimes help. Um, and I'm, I apologize if I go really quickly, but I wanted to get it all in. Um, <clears throat> so here we go. Can everyone, can you see the screen? Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Lindsay Burke. I work with ACORN, um, as John mentioned, the, it's the Addison County Relocalization Network. And this is a really tiny nonprofit with a mission to strengthen the local food and farm economy around the Champlain Valley. We have no full-time staff, no office. There's a volunteer working board with six current working members um, and we were established in 2005, so we've been working in the local food system for about 15 years. And I've been working with ACORN for about five years, but I'm also an environmental activist uh, and a small business owner. And as John mentioned, um, the intersection of food with the climate crisis um, is, a, is, a, is a really natural tie-in, and I, that's where I get a lot of my passion for this work. Um, so I'm here to speak about the Pharmacy Food as Medicine program, and I'm also going to touch on a few of the other programs that ACORN is working on currently, so I'm going to just speed on through. And the pharmacy, if you haven't heard of a healthcare share or food as medicine program, um, we distribute 12 weeks of fresh local fruit and vegetables to about 65 families who are experiencing food insecurity or diet related disease such as diabetes or heart disease. Um, we partner with three local small family farms and some and four local healthcare providers um, to pair us with the patients. We also partner with the Vermont Department of Health, Rise Vermont, Middlebury Co-op, and a lot of volunteers. So this program really wouldn't work if we didn't collaborate with all of our amazing network of community organizations. Um, and I wanted to show some photos from last year's program and in, in comparison to this year's. Last year's was our first year running this program, and I know this program does run with about six other uh, in about six other regions around the state, and they have run longer than Addison County, so ours is a bit newer than um, some of the other uh, pharmacy programs in the state. Um, so here you see last year there was some in-person educational um, moments. People were able to taste some, some tasty treats using the food that we were delivering, and there was just a lot of good socialization that was happening every week at the pickup compared to this year, which we went curbside, um, the food went straight from a truck into to folks' cars. There was limited touch points. Uh, we didn't do the tasty treats. So we really we relied on this newsletter in the bottom right-hand corner to show what was in the bag, how to cook it. And on the back side of the newsletter, there would be some more educational information about some of our partner organizations. Um, and that was just a way to keep the educational component going because we recognize that a lot of the families aren't familiar with some of the foods that we grow locally. Um, and we wanted to make sure they knew how to eat the food. Another thing we did this year uh, to replace the educational component, uh, the, the, the missing in-person component was this pharmacy kitchen hangout that we did on Zoom with a local budget conscious chef named Matt Laux. Uh, and he volunteered his time to use one of the week's produce bags, so actually using the produce that the families got, and showed his best uh, practices of how to cook and 
clean and store the food. Um, and it was a really casual online um, session that we did. And you see Emily there from the Middlebury Natural Foods Co-op. She helped run it. And we were doing this at the Hannaford Career Center. So a lot, again, a lot of really fabulous um, community partnerships that helped make this, this program run. And we are currently um, planning for next year's and we are currently fundraising for that um, program. And here's some more photos. Um, you can see Matt um, taking the fresh basil and showing folks how to make pesto. We know a lot of people don't have Cuisinart, so food processors or blenders. So he's trying to do it um, the most basic way possible. Uh, <clears throat> and here um, we, this year, uh, when COVID happened and the shutdown happened in March, as John touched on, a lot of the farmers lost their markets when institutions, restaurants, and farmers markets closed. Um, so Acorn wanted to step in and try to see if we could help fill the gap of the market and connect people directly with their farms and food producers. So uh, we created a super quick, rough online market using our own website um, and two volunteer um, distribution locations, one in Bristol, the Tandem Kitchen, and then the other Hannaford Career Center in Middlebury. Uh, we used volunteers for distribution and Acorn didn't take any money. So we were really relying on um, the e-commerce sites uh, the farmers and food producers had. And that, that showed us that there was a, a giant technology gap between the farmers and food producers who are, who are online and do have a website and have a good online presence and those that don't. And we found that quite a lot of farmers and food producers barely have a, an online presence. They might have a Facebook page. So uh, after five weeks, we decided to close the market as our farmers markets reopened, um, but we were able to circulate $10,000 within our local food economy, which we thought was pretty good. And there is a case study on our website if you want to learn more about that. The last thing I want to touch on um, is the online market that we're current, uh, the online app that we're currently developing. And that is in relation, we couldn't print the local food and farm guide, which you see in the bottom left-hand corner. We've printed that guide for the last 13 years, and that shows the t nearly 250 farms and food producers in the Champlain Valley. And that connects um, both residents and tourists directly with the farms and um, food producers in our area. So because we couldn't print that this year, um, I was able to start a project I wanted to do for a long time and create an app using all the information that we have. And so with a partnership with some Middlebury College student developers, this is currently in beta testing and we're hoping to launch this in November. Um, so stay tuned for that. And that is something that's definitely scalable for the whole state if there's interest. And then the other thing, um, going back to the online market, we are in a current um, phase two of the online market. We're collaborating with some folks from Middlebury College and some food producers to create a better integrated online market that has one central platform, one e-commerce platform, and we're working on the aggregation and distribution piece for that. So, Thank you for your time and um, please be in touch um, with any questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, now I want to turn it over uh, to Ben Waterman, who's with the Vermont Land Trust. Uh, ben, go for it. Oop. Hold. Oop, still, All right. How's that? There you go. Gotcha. Okay, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen as well here. Just bear with me. All right. So I'm, I'm here to talk about the Pine Island Community Farm. I, I, my job with the Vermont Land Trust is to manage um, all of the the fee-owned lands or, or, or properties or farms that the Vermont Land Trust owns. It's not, it's not really typical for the land trust. Typically the land trust conserves farms, but does not own them. But there are several farms across the state that have placed special emphasis on community engagement. And so the Vermont Land Trust owns those properties, manages them and supports programming. So Pine Island is an example of a farm that's, um, that's really geared towards food access and, and food security. Uh, serving resettled refugee communities in the Burlington area. So there are thousands of resettled refugees, many of whom have farming backgrounds, who come to the Burlington area 
and all of a sudden do not have access to land, do not have access to production resources. Um, and um, so these communities were, were hit especially hard during COVID. Uh, a lot of resettled refugees work in the service industry and, um, and do not work on farms like they used to way back in the day. Um, so they, they, a, lot, a lot of unemployment in these communities. Um, food security has been really critical, especially recently. So just a little bit of background on the farm. It's about, um, I wanna say a little under 200 acres. This is the farmstead complex. Uh, there's a lot going on here. We started the farm about eight or nine years ago, kind of in response to the need expressed by, by the resettled refugee communities to, um, for, for goat meat and for other proteins that were really hard to come by. So these are uh, culturally important foods that the farm is geared, now geared uh, towards producing. So this is uh, a farm said a lot going on here. There's poultry, small poultry houses, there's larger poultry hoop houses, barns. There's two residences uh, where a couple of the farmers who run the enterprises live. There's also eight acres of community gardens at Pine Island Community Farm. So the farm sits, it's in Colchester um, on this kind of strange landform, this mound looking, you can't really see in the photo here, but it's looking out over the Winooski River Valley. So water quality is also a special focus and emphasis at the farm. Whatever farming practices that go on uh, need to be in sync with maintaining, if not improving water quality in Winooski. This is Chuda Darali. He's this kind of the spearhead uh, leader in, in the Reseta refugee communities. And he currently runs the goat meat enterprise. And this is Teojin Mohoro. Uh, originally from Burundi, he is running the meat bird enterprise. So there's, he processes, slaughters, processes, and sells upwards of 5,000 birds a year. And Chuda here, he's probably um, surpassed the 400 goat level this year. It's really, the, the theme here is all about access to, for the community members, for the consumers, access to culturally important food. Um, and, um, and, and it's really a, kind of the quality that they, that that they expect it's really a high quality meat. They're, they're going, they're picking out live animals and, um, and the farm is, is serving them. So for all of you who might be wondering how, how the heck can, can we pull this off in our communities? Uh, it, you know, small livestock enterprises I, I think are, are doable, but they do, they do require um, kind of infrastructure build out, obviously. They, um, we, we do have two, two state uh, certified slaughterhouse facilities on the farm. They're custom slaughter facilities. I know there's a lot of work going on across the state on how to kind of expand those kinds of models that have become really needed as of late. Um, but it, it, do, it does take some play. You know, obviously don't have time to talk about kind of how we got started here, but, but definitely um, email me, give me a call, and we can talk through how the land trust and, and uh, leaders within the community kind of initiated this this kind of community enterprise. I think the community gardens uh, is probably a, a little bit more practical. It's less less research, less capital intensive to start. Um, so, you know, it's it's just it, it requires a little bit of land. We have eight acres at the Pine Island Community Farm. They're split up into eighth acre plots. So there's about forty plots on on eight acres. And um, if you think about that, that's, that's a little bit more than your average kind of backyard garden growing tomatoes and carrots. And eight, you can grow a lot of food on, on an eighth of an acre for your family. Uh, so whether it's an eighth of an acre or half acre plots or, or 20th of an acre plots, I mean, there's, there's um, a community garden can be very possible with just a little bit of land. You know, you know, that could be in the, um, the back area of a church. It could be a, it could be a town owned land. It could be a school, um, maybe an acre that's set aside. It's not being utilized. There's so many options and um, it does require access to water. So we do have a full irrigation system here. Uh, and, and then access to tillage, uh, some kind of tractor, some kind of service, custom hire service that could till the land um, is also kind of a key component to get a community garden started. We go a little bit further. We, pro we, uh, we provide production resources to the farmers and gardeners. So um, with COVID, it was especially important that, that when folks did get onto the land, they have a good year this year. 
So we actually provided fertilizers free of charge to all the gardeners. We provide, we, we hauled in um, about 25 yards of compost and provided that free of charge to gardeners. And, um, and it, it, that really goes a long way. Like, you know, a little bit of soil fertility boost can go a long way in helping folks have, have really productive yields. So lastly, we, had, we initiated another program this year. This is, this is something that, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be part of a community garden program, obviously, but we initiated uh, what we call the Freezers for Food Access Program, where participants would get a cost share in the purchase of a chest freezer. So Vermont Land Trust kicked in 85% of the cost um, to purchase a chest freezer. Participants kicked in 15% of their own money. And uh, this is aimed towards extending those benefits of a, of a, you know, a cornucopia harvest um, during the growing season into the the deep, long, dark months of winter. And um, there, there's been a, a really huge demand, really surprisingly huge demand for this program. We filled 30 slots, so we're in the process of fulfilling those right now. And we have 20, almost 25 more people on the waiting list to get into this program, which we currently do not have funding for. But um, well, we hope to serve those folks as well in the future. So. Um, that's all I had in five or six minutes, but um, happy to answer any questions and follow up later. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Ben. That was definitely, mm -hmm. uh, definitely inspiring uh, to see. Finally, I want to introduce Liz Ruffa, who uh, uh, I've gotten to know better because I, I did some work with BCRD in Dorset and Liz is uh, uh, quite a leader there, member of the select board and, and works at Merck Forest and also a real food leader. So Liz uh, and Nick, I think you've got a screen to share for Liz. So whenever Liz says go for it. Mm -hmm. All right, Liz. So thanks for that, Ben and Nick, you can go for it whenever you like. That's perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Liz Ruffa. I work at Merck Forest and Farmland Center, and I um, am pleased to have been asked to share a little bit about a project that we've been working on down here since COVID blanketed all of our worlds last year. Um, just to kind of preface, Bennington County has a very vibrant and talented, but um, a bit underdeveloped of, of a food system. Uh, farmers do a lot of work, but there had net, a lot of the cohesion and the network building work that um, that we see in systems that work well um, haven't really been fully realized down here as much as in other parts of the state. Um, but in 2019, Merck Forest had the opportunity to to co-host four sales and marketing forums for the Meadowy Valley and North Shire area farmers, which we did with help from the Vermont Land Trust and in partnership with a wonderful young um, farmer named Mara Hurst who runs Levy Lamb. And out of those four forums, we, um, um, everyone worked together to figure out that what everybody in this area really wanted to see happen next was to build out a network, to work on our regional branding and that everybody wanted to sell more food. So just as we were uh, in the process of putting together all of the work that we'd done through these four forums, COVID hit and the disruption that we've all been talking about happened. And so we realized that we had these 40 plus farmers and food businesses attention. And so we asked the farmers who have always been our North star on this project, if, um, you know, how had their markets been impacted and did they need some help moving some food? to which everyone said absolutely yes yesterday. So in April, we started a um, single point of contact, contact online marketplace where there was a single point of contact both for the supply um, aspect and for the demand aspect. We sent out about 25 emails and we got 62 customers and we um, used a little farm stand that was um, in the parking lot of J.K. Adams, which is a store in Dorset. And we started moving a little bit of food. Um, 
seven months later, you can see by the numbers that this has really, really just taken stock in our community. And it's this pop-up idea of how we could help farmers when none of us really knew how long COVID was going to last, what, what was going to happen, um, has now turned into this program where we have moved a lot of food for a lot of farmers, um, posted some really great local economic um, impact numbers for the food system itself. And so we'd never really seen that down in Dorset before this, this um, real celebration of the local food economy. Um, and we also were able to harness our customer bases feeling of generosity. And I think that they also were genuinely thankful that they had had a safe and healthy way to access food, in, especially in the spring when there was so much um, confusion about what was going on. And so we started a program called Neighbors in Need, which is a customer generated or people, I like to call it people, people powered philanthropy, where on their order form, folks can also donate money towards getting these boxes out to folks in our community that um, might not be able to afford them on their own. So we've also been able to do that, to do that, which has been really great. Our, um, the platform that we're using is kind of a bundled CSA notion, which, um, which so we, we cre create these kind of lightly themed boxes that has up to 20 different farmers products in it. Folks buy the boxes and then there also are a bunch of add-ons that they can offer uh, that they can also purchase on kind of more of an a la carte basis. And so what we've seen happen down in little old Dorset is that this, this pop-up project has really created the bones for a hyper local community food system. And it seems to be working really, really well. It's this three or four part partnership between the farmers and the food businesses themselves, uh, customers, and our neighbors in need with a lot of really great local partnership in between. And I think that the, the kind of um, guiding glue through all three or four of those um, items are health and safety and economic growth and stability and variety and quality. So it's quite exciting to see happen. And it's whenever we, email our folks and ask if they are good and we, they, it's okay if we were to stop. We hear that that's the last thing in the world that we should do. So um, that allows me to really talk about how absolutely integral to the success of this was the fact that Mark Forrest and Farmland Center stepped up to be the administrative backbone and to incubate the project. And so that has been really, really great. It's also another thing that's a key um, indicator about this is that it's been so volunteer driven. We have a group of really amazing core volunteers that are doing the curating, doing the organizing, kind of running the markets, but there are all sorts of other people that are chipping in and helping out. And we have a really, really loyal customer base that is um, really making it work. So, um, you know, out of those dark clouds and out of crummy situations, sometimes, um, as John had mentioned earlier, you know, there's, um, there are opportunities that can come out of uh, disruption. And I think that this is a great example of that. And um, that's what the project's about. Uh, thank you, Liz. And thank you, Megan and uh, Lindsay and Ben and Sarah. That's really uh, a powerful overview and some good, uh, good inspiration there. You know, at this point, I really just want to open it up for any specific questions for our presenters, if anyone has those. And then I think we'll, we'll kind of transition into an open forum. But let's start with any Q&A. Feel free to sort of wave at me if you want to speak or, um, or use the raise hand function or, or just unmute or also use the chat function if that's uh, better for you. So any questions for our presenters today?
Uh, oh, here we, funding. Okay, Ashley Buchanan's asked a question about funding for the pharmacy program. Uh, how do you stitch that together? A great question. <laughs> In 2019, um, it was, well, both 2019 and 2020, a lot of the, the bulk of the money came from Porter Medical, which is, is the backbone of the three of the healthcare providers that the clinics that we um, work with for, for the, where we get our patients, how, we, how we're connected with the patients. Um, so Porter Medical Center um, and then ACORN provides some funding based on our project. So historically, ACORN does not rely, did not rely on grants, but uh, we run our own programs that generate money like the Tour de Farms and the Food and Farm Guide that I mentioned. Um, but this year, we are writing grants for the pharmacy programs because we've lost two thirds of our funding because we couldn't run the programs due to COVID. So the, 2021 will be a mix of grants and funding from Porter. Porter has said that they, are, they can collaborate with us next year, but it won't be in the same capacity as this year. So we might need to lower the amount of shares. Um, we, did, we had 65 shares this year and we had 45 last year. So we were hoping to grow again, but we might have to go down, which is unfortunate because we know the need will still be around next year in a greater capacity. So it's a mix of, it's a mix of grants um, and nonprofit funding and, and Porter or, or the healthcare. We also partnered with one private healthcare provider this year. They, and they funded their three family shares just from the generosity of the private clinic. Um, so it's a mix. Do I know how who funded? I'm so, I don't understand the last. Yeah, maybe a little clarity, but as we're waiting for clarity there, Liz, you've got a question about, were, you know, as you started a new CA, CSA, was, was there competitive issues, whether with, that's with other CSAs or maybe other food producers in, in the neighborhood, let's say? Um, sure, so that is a, a great question and it is something that we absolutely, um, uh, you know, worked as a, a team to to make sure it didn't happen. We we hit just in terms of the timing. We were able to 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 pop up with this model as the farmers markets were having such a hard time in April and May figuring out how to pivot to going from a a, a normal indoor um, farmers market um, to what the the state what everyone thought thought was safe. And so what we have done is we have just always been in touch with our competitors. We spend a lot of time and a lot of um, ink from the local copy shop, making sure that all of our customers know where they can find all this other extra food. Um, I think from the farmer's point of view, and they have always been our North Star, they have been happy because even though the Dorset market was able to, to reboot the summer, it has been very, very busy. We are doing things at a volume so that they can really be selling us 150 units of various things and maybe they don't have to do so much of the other kind of pop-up market. Uh, but we are, we, we want this project not to be another market, uh, kind of a bricks and mortar type of market, but we want it to really be an amplifier for helping people figure out how they can support themselves through their health and support their farmers and economy by finding this food. So we're always um, sharing other stories and making sure that folks know all the other places that they can get it. Super. Thanks, Liz. Yep. Other questions uh, for our presenters at this point? You know, I just want to mention something. Oh, I see Paul's got a question. Um, but uh, just quickly before, uh, you know, one interesting thing I heard as a theme is I heard the Tuck School mentioned in a project. I think Sarah mentioned. I heard Middlebury. I heard Bennington College. Like, boy, if we think about our educational partners as potential partners and resources, that's a, a, a great uh, resource to be keeping in mind as, as we do this work. Paul. Sorry. I wonder if the three leaders who have spoken would share perspective with other leaders in ag development and community food systems. Like, were there any lessons you've learned or things that you would say to encourage other people to step up? Like, what are some of the messages you would use to other leaders to encourage them to step up and 
take on projects in their communities. Hmm. It's a good question, Paul. I'd, I'd emphasize that there, just generally speaking, there's so much potential within communities um, for folks who want to produce their own food, food, who want to enable access to healthy food. I think there's there's just that 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 potential energy that is that is there. It really, and it's just a matter of of kind of tapping into it, and then uh, responding to it whether that be through a community gardening program or through a food share program or organizing farmers and the kinds of CSAs that we heard about today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I just add to that and, and say that I think part of the real value and success of our project is that it's felt really citizen led rather than a bunch of leaders coming in to say, I mean, the, our customers, really grew the program and they're the ones that that are continuing to want to take advantage of it and um so it's you know it not to simplify things but in a way when when this when everyone talks and including the state about a buy local campaign there's no better buy local campaign than supporting your local food economy yeah, and one of the things that we're thinking of doing um, is actually doing some public service announcements, partnering with our local uh, community media organization and just starting to get that kind of messaging out. We've started to do something similar using Front Porch Forum, um, mm -hmm. just posting, hey, these are the, this is what's in season right now, go visit these farms, um, right. just a super quick connection to keep people's, you know, to keep it top of the radar. And then also yep. to Sarah's point of view, there's a lot of statewide organizations if people are looking to get plugged in, even at a local level, if you join your local hunger council, there's so many people and so much information mm -hmm. about what, where the need is, or any of the farm to plate working groups also provide a lot of good connections at a local level. So there's quite a few networks that are already around that people can plug into. Great, thank you. I see a couple of hands raised. So we'll go to Spoon and then uh, Monica and then Andrew after that. So Spoon, it's uh, go for it. Spoon, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Uh, you've unmuted, but somehow your mic doesn't seem to be working for us. Uh, all right, so we we have it coming from uh, Spoon in chat. Why don't we go to Monica while we um, while Spoon types that into chat? Um, hi, everybody. This has been really wonderful to listen to, and um, I just wanted to make a comment about working with educational partners. Um, I work at Vermont Law School, but I'm also on the select board in Hancock, and we have a um, kind of a, a strange little valley in that we are the easternmost part of Addison County over a mountain, so um, we don't always like access services in, in um, Addison County, but then uh, one of our towns is also the westernmost part of uh, Windsor County. So we're kind of, uh, we're isolated and uh, we have kind of overlapping and, and we sometimes fall through the cracks in terms of services. So we, um, this, uh, during COVID, a bunch of uh, community leaders got together and we realized that in talking and supporting each other, that um, there was definitely a need in terms of food security and that we had difficulty accessing um, services in our area and people were going either as far down as West Lebanon to um, access food shelves and um, over to uh, um, Waitsfield and then over to Middlebury. So we kind of wanted to bring people closer to home so that they weren't traveling so far. So we've been able to, we decided to do a food security um, survey and analysis, and we did that with um, Vermont Law School, 
We uh, recruited a couple of uh, master students in food and agriculture law and policy, and we have a uh, report that will be coming out soon. Um, we formed a new um, nonprofit called Feeding the Valley Alliance, and we've been able to partner with Gifford Hospital um, to bring Veggie Van Gogh over uh, to our area, but unfortunately, there's been a lack of funding uh, or capacity ra rather um, from the food bank. So we've been unable to continue with that for now. We hope that that will resume. Um, and we've also been partnering with Hope to do food drops in Granville. And um, we're uh, just partnering with Everybody Eats uh, or Everyone Eats to um, bring some um, meals over. And I think that starts this week. I'm not certain of that date. Um, so we're, you know, looking forward to being an organization that, um, that will bring resources to the Valley, not necessarily provide direct service, but definitely be that, um, that place where people can come to see who they can access resources from and, and hopefully uh, develop more partnerships. Super. Uh, thanks, Monica. Uh, Andrew. Yes, this is a question for Liz, Sarah, Lindsay, maybe the folks from Salvation Farms. Um, I'm curious if there is sort of a um, broader discussion about gleaning going on um, through my connections with farmers. I know that often um, they like the idea of gleaning, but really they want to sell as much of their product as possible, especially in this tough season. Um, and some of the gleaning efforts that I've been involved with have um, actually reached out to home gardeners and tried to get some of their excess produce in season, um, setting up drop-off points, for example, at libraries as um, Margaret mentioned, and I'm wondering if um, if any of you can can speak to that uh, sort of delicate question with farmers of um, paying them what you can pay them for the food, but also then trying to access things at the end of the season to to feed the people who need it. I'm happy to. Uh to um, speak to a little bit about, so the, the way that we organized pricing with our CSA, because again, we're not trying to replace a farmer's market. We're not trying to replace that business for the farms, but to, to help them move what's extra is that um, we did come up with uh, pricing that was completely up to them, but it, it was kind of a wholesale light or wholesale plus for us to be able to give um, our customers as much as we could by purchasing. We did add a percentage and we added a handling fee, but it still is very much uh, reasonable. The, one of the interesting things about North Shire Grown Direct is that um, I am one of three of four kind of major organizers and two of them work for an organization called Grateful Hearts, which is a really great gleaning operation down in Bennington County that gleans food and then sorry, cooks, uh, makes, makes prepared food with it. And so we've, we've developed this kind of interesting, almost like recycling system where we buy a little bit of extra food from all, from all the farmers because we know we want them to get good checks. And then we sell as much as we can. And then what we can't sell, we pass on to Grateful Hearts. Um, so, you know, we're, I've always been really interested in that kind of where, how, how can, where's that market between gleaning and a wholesaler or a retail, you know, how can we help farmers be able to recoup their costs for extra food that they have monetarily? Um, and so that's one of the things that we're looking to um, creatively address with this project without underselling their product and messing up their kind of internal and external markets. Great. Others, I don't know, Teresa, I think you're with Salvation Farms. I don't know if you wanted to add something. 
Yeah, um, that's a good question, Andrew. Um, so there is a network of gleaners in Vermont, the uh, Vermont Gleaning Collective of which there are six different members. There's also Grateful Hearts in the Vermont Food Bank that glean outside of that collective. They are members at this point. Um, and there are some uh, new conversations happening around creating a gleaning, a gleaning program in the um, Northeast Kingdom. One of the things that Salvation Farms has been looking at is really a tiered approach to managing farm surplus in this state and how can we um, uh, glean when appropriate and when can we broker for farms or add additional handling um, when surplus exists. The bottleneck in doing so is really the physical infrastructure and the operating overhead of doing so. Um, but it's a, a, a nut we're trying to work on cracking. Um, and to Liz's point, you know, we don't want to undercut farm markets, but we think that if we can create creative programming that addresses supply chain issues, that can also compensate farmers while building um, some more structural resilience into our supply chain, um, we should be able to manage this surplus in a way that serves both charitable and likely some institutional outlets. But um, that's a huge community project with lots of different players. Um, and we need to be considerate of what the farm needs um, as well as, as the, the market. We've explored brokering and have done so successfully with correctional facilities, mm -hmm. um, but that's because we can send them bulk volumes of product that, um, that the um, inmate population can handle as, as workers in the kitchen. So I don't know if that fully answers your question. Thank you. Uh, you know, I see Brad Long from Efficiency Vermont, and um, they've got some programs for local farmers that I want to just give Brad a chance to mention. Hi. Uh, thank you, John. And um, this is a really exciting conversation. I'm happy to be part of this. This is pretty cool. Um, and thanks to um, VCRD for hosting this and, and getting everybody together. This is um, an important part of our economy here and the health of our state. And it's really been exciting to hear what everybody's been doing to pull together and, and everybody in a healthy and sustainable manner. Um, so excited to be here. Uh, I'm a community engagement manager, but I'm also working in 2021 uh, with um, indoor growing environments. I'm trying to help uh, farmers and uh, distributors find more efficient ways to um, produce their food and store their food and distribute their food. And I just wanted to mention um, that I'm available as a resource, but uh, a couple of things real quick here that we've been offering some incentives on and we'll continue to for 2021. Um, thermal curtains for farmers uh, can be an important way to save a couple of dollars. Um, controllers for lighting, uh, heating and ventilation, uh, pipe insulation and other air sealing. Um, we have some custom incentives available for uh, greenhouse coverings, uh, whether it's polyethylene, polycarbonate, infrared films, um, we have LED uh, incentives up to 50% off per fixture for growing. We have heating system upgrades, whether it's in ground or underground bench heating, wood, wood boilers, heat pumps, geothermal heat pumps. Uh, and we're happy to bundle um, incentives together for kind of bonus incentives. But um, we have a um, uh, refrigeration system team here that is really top notch at helping people find alternative ways to refrigerate their food and or economize it. And um, we're seeing a, a large growth in the hemp production market right now and the drying. And um, that's been a, a challenge for a lot of the farmers. So we're offering some technical assistance and some um, mechanical incentives there as well. Uh, we have some loan programs that are three and a half to 5% mm -hmm. interest rate for three to 10 year loans to help uh, farmers and producers bridge some of those gaps right now. Um, so we have a lot of programs. And I wanted to mention, we work with Jericho Settlers Farm up in Colchester. They're saving about $13,400 per year in incentive uh, in energy costs. And we did that through greenhouse controllers. Uh, it's optimizing the, um, the greenhouses to heat and ventilate only when necessary. We are offering them, we uh, help them with some advanced refrigeration technologies, including evaporator fan controls, efficient motors, and some simple strip curtains to allow the, the entrance to the coolers um, to have uh, less, less uh, escape of the cooling um, heat recovery unit. This is kind of cool. Uh, it's capturing waste heat released from the product of uh, produce coolers refrigeration system. Uh, we've then redirected that excess to a storage area that's used for onions, squash, and garlic. 
the heat is used to cure uh, and slowly dry the crop so it'll keep well through the winter. It's kind of a cool use, uh, alternative use of, um, of heat. Uh, and a wood pellet boiler. Um, this is helping the farm uh, grow year round. Um, so it's, uh, it's a way that we can help these farmers and um, we're, we're aiming this program at small, medium sized farms, uh, food shelves and, and other areas that are part of this economy. So if there's any way that Efficiency Vermont can help, I'm, I'm here as a resource and I'm happy to speak with anybody. Thanks, John, for giving me an opportunity. Thanks, Brad. Really um, appreciate your great work. And also just to mention one other aspect to this work that I'm familiar with is when there are nonprofit local food shelves, sometimes there's refrigeration issues, just like we've been talking about today. And uh, anytime anyone is investing in anything that involves energy, like to me, one of those things is talk to Efficiency Vermont, figure out what you're eligible for, be sure to be accessing those programs. So to me, that's another example where you're talking about refrigeration and freezer sometimes. I know uh, Efficiency Vermont's done some really creative work there as well. So, um, awesome. You know, I'm seeing a lot of back and forth in the chat, um, which I, frankly, I'm having a hard time keeping up with. I do want to just acknowledge uh, Margaret from the Charlotte Library. Like that um, conversation feels like a, an exciting one, right? Think about our libraries. They're such valuable hubs in all, so many of our communities. And, um, and that question of how do we plug them into this work and how do we think about um, really maximizing the potential of, of our library. So it seems like a conversation might get going there. Um, I'm, I'm just scanning. Uh, Nick, I don't know if you're, uh, if you can help me sort of scan the chat, if you've got anything else. You know, there's also sure. a little, a bit of a conversation with Spoon about sort of that dependence on government funding and some uncertainty about that. And how are we building structures uh, and institutions that maybe don't have that dependency built in. That's a, a tough one. I saw John an open question from uh, Jacqueline Labate a, a little bit back, uh, just about in our area, we have lots of programs for feeding folks, identifying those in need and getting food to them is always sensitive, especially welcoming those who are reluctant to self-identify as food insecure, wondering what other strategies folks have employed to get help where it's needed. That's a great question. Anyone want to take a crack at that? Any observations? I, I can try it from the, from the pharmacy perspective, which really puts um, the food as medicine um, in the doctor's offices. So we're really trying to make the connection that healthy food is um, yeah, it's a medical. It's tied to the medical system. In 2019, in 20, in 2019 it was really easy to do. The, the nurse practitioners or the doctors would directly refer patients when they screen for food insecurity. Um, and so that was a way to do it in a really confidential manner. This year, people weren't going to the offices. So we had to figure out a creative way to get people who were screening as food insecure, but may, maybe we couldn't get the referral directly from the doctors. So we actually posted on Front Porch Forum, which gave a huge mm -hmm. influence of mm -hmm. referral. So people, uh, I think if it's confidential, they're not hesitant to say they need food, they, they need uh, help. The, um, but people also, on the flip side, were very cognizant of not taking food away from people that might need it more. So we had people dropping out of the program saying, I actually don't think I need this as much as my community members or my neighbors might need this. Um, so I haven't seen the stigma so much um, if it's done in a really confidential way. We also teamed up with the nurses who were um, handing out food at the schools, and they were mm -hmm. able to identify families that might be um, might need it a little bit more. So we kind of did more of a grassroots way around the doctor's offices since COVID. Mm -hmm. um, people weren't going into their, their offices. Excellent. Liz. Hi, it's Liz. And I just wanted to echo that with our Neighbors in Need program, we uh, intentionally worked to develop community connectors and they get the food out. So it, it's some, it's folks that are, we have somebody that is a nurse in a school, somebody that works in a local, very small local food shelf, and someone who works in a local church. We make the 40 bags every market and they come and they do the distribution themselves, which feels like it's uh, private and, um, and that everyone is kind of respected in, in their role. Certainly the schools is a great place. We've also gotten extra apples and just kind of drop some stuff off for 
um, all the school districts are doing it differently. But in our district, Wednesday seems to be kind of a, a day where there's a different kind of family drop-off situation. And so we're also trying to get certain things, you know, safely bagged and, and just available for folks to take. Great, thank you. You know, uh, in case it isn't obvious, we've sort of trans transitioned into more of an open dialogue. I do want to give other folks a, a chance. I suspect there's many on this call who've, who've been working on projects of their own and just want to uh, encourage anyone to share anything that they think others, others might be interested. Also, thanks to Paul and Nick, they, they've reminded us that we have our Vermont uh, Community Leadership Guide. Uh, I've always got my copy close at hand here. And there is a, you know, there are, there are many useful chapters, but one specifically around building an agricultural network, a local ag network, that I think um, speaks to this moment. I mean, I, I really, you know, actually probably true of ACORN and, uh, and the work that Liz did, you think about building that network and sometimes you don't know how that network's gonna come in handy. And then all of a sudden you have to deploy it in response to things. And, and so sometimes, um, yeah, just building that infrastructure of knowing who are your producers, who are your markets, and then figuring out what are the projects that you can use to build that cohesion amongst that network is, is certainly a, a worthwhile endeavor. Other examples of, of things going on in communities that, uh, that anyone wants to share? Um, I, have a, I have a question, um, not something that I'm doing, but I just had a question for all the people who spoke and it was, are there ways, like I know that this year was a crazy year, but um, that you're kind of thinking about ways um, that to bring people who are food insecure, like to the table, like as stakeholders or ways to kind of include them more in, um, in this process. Yeah, we actually did invite um, a few of our more engaged uh, pharmacy patient members to the table, literally. We have a monthly committee meeting and they do attend the meeting and they can get feedback from a participant point of view. So that is definitely a, a, a key component to this. Otherwise, it's, it's just people talking about what they think folks need and not actually hearing it from themselves. So it's a, a good point. Others? Uh, Jess, I think I saw you were preparing uh, to unmute there. Yeah, I just wanted to share. We um, did a victory garden this year um, and then created what we call the mad stand. So it was just um, very simple, but people could come and pay what they want or take what they needed. Um, and it was pretty successful. So we'll definitely be continuing that. And then this group is also doing the Vermont's Everyone Eats. And um, once that ends in mid-December, we will be, um, we're looking at processing our own foods and creating soups and stews to continue with um, pop-up food distribute, uh, distribution sites um, like that. Um, also putting it near the laundromat and the low-income housing. Um, but I will say our group is also um, um, reaching out to people we recognize might be a little bit more in need and realizing that how important that is to have their input. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. Great, thanks. I see a question from Wendy in chat. I don't know if anyone knows about the Vermont Agrarian Commons and can speak to that. I see Lindsay nodding her head. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, it's in, so the Vermont, Tru uh, the Agrarian Trust is a nationwide nonprofit that establishes a commons in different states. Now, I'm not, I'm not a, a spokesperson. This is what I understand. Um, and the, the commons is a new way of land ownership. So the, the commons is the nonprofit that is within Vermont that will own land that then leases it to a group of people who are going to manage that communally or cooperatively. And it's new. There is the first one in Vermont is going to be Bread and Butter Farm up in South Burlington. So I think there is a web, yeah, there's a, you put the website there. Um, and you can reach out to them. Allison Nyhart is on the board. She's pretty 
uh, communicative, and I think Megan Browning is the other person. Um, but it's brand new in Vermont, so I don't have too many details besides that. Thanks, Lindsay. Others, other sort of questions or points to share as we uh, look to wrap up here. Spoon, I appreciate you drawing some attention to co-ops. You know, one of the conversations I had in preparing for this is that our food co-ops, I know you're talking more generally about agricultural co-ops, but, but we can't forget our food co-ops as really important hubs. And in Vermont, we've got more of them than in most other places, right? Tiny little co-ops that play a really important role in connecting our communities uh, with, with local food. I also just want to mention, you know, we, we should never forget about, uh, and this is echoing something I heard from Becca at Vital Communities, you know, our, our dairy farmers in Vermont are a really important part of our statewide infrastructure. And sometimes I think when we t think local food, we forget a little bit about the dairy piece. But as Becca reminded me, we all, I think, are consumers in so many different ways, whether that's uh, the milk or the cheese. And so just that reminder of, um, of, the, of our dairy community as, as a real sort of foundational piece of this is just something, something to keep in mind. Other questions or uh, things to share as we bring things to a close? I really, uh, oh, Christine, are you, um, or maybe I'm just seeing yeah, yeah. I have a, um, a question in terms of transportation. Um, I'm with the Healthy Roots Collaborative. We work in Franklin and Grand Isle counties. And one of the things we run into both on like the commercial side, but also on the charitable food side is just getting the, the food to the people that need it, whether it's like the stores that need it or people who are food insecure or people that are buying food. Um, and I think the, I think COVID has highlighted that even more, but just thinking of like creative solutions to better transport food, especially in a place in Vermont where, you know, having access to a car is like almost necessary, but not everyone does. And yeah, I think we're just, we haven't found a solution for that. And that's something I think the wall that we keep hitting up against and not sure if any of you have seen or done something that has worked really well in your community or if you guys are sort of seeing similar, similar issues. You know, uh, uh, Lindsay, go for it. I can take that one. Um, with the pharmacy program, we definitely had people who could not make the weekly pickup. So we had, uh, a vo we had volunteers, I, I dropped off quite a few bags directly to people's homes or their workplaces. Uh, we also had a volunteer from our local um, Addison Allies, which is our migrant farm worker organization. Um, we had a few migrant farm worker families that were part of the program and a volunteer would drive out and drop off their boxes as well. So it was definitely reliant on volunteers. Um, we also didn't restrict, we didn't restrict pickup to just the patient. So if the patient had a neighbor or a friend or somebody else that could come pick up the food for them. We said that was okay. And we also um, held the food after, or, or were, we made it available at different times if people couldn't pick up that actual food. We were also thinking about reaching out to ACTOR, which is our local public transportation to see if they could do it, but we didn't have to go there, but that was kind of a, like a plan C. Definitely a problem here in Addison County. Yeah, I would just echo that, that Transportation is a systemic issue on really all sides of the conversation because we spend a lot of time also picking up food from, from farms and food businesses because it's just a huge help to them if they don't have to make that, that drive. We encouraged as much carpooling as could happen given the COVID situation and not wanting to, you know, put people too, too close to together. Uh, but yeah, transportation is um, definitely something we all need to work on. You know, 
know, I'll mention something that started pre-COVID and probably has fallen by the wayside, but in Dorset, there was a little initiative where there was a weekend shopping shuttle that was going. Now, this is less about local food, let's say, but more about food access. Is like, how do we connect people with those transportation challenges to mm -hmm. the resources they need? And it was sort of based out of the local church and sort of every other weekend, maybe yeah. a van would go to a major shopping location. But it highlights sort of that um, that transportation challenge as really uh, important uh, to tackle. Uh, Nick Landry, Nicholas Landry, go for it. Hi, um, pardon the background noise. I was listening in. My partner are building a homestead here in Barrie, so I'm calling in from the yard. Um, I just wanted to touch base on that food access thing because that's why I was listening in. We have that same problem in Barrie City where we're surrounded by farms and grocery stores in the town, but we have a lot of people who walk and live without cars in the city and they have to walk two to five miles to access food. Um, so one of the things we're doing, uh, a really kind of simple thing is just build a grocery store. We don't have a grocery store in Barry City, so a group of us got together to build a co-op. Um, and I say simple, because it's not easy. It's been a few years in the making and it's got a few years left to go. Um, but there, there are organizations out there like uh, National Food Co-op Association, Neighborhood Food Co-op Association and the Food Co-op Initiative, um, who have really great plans and they're communicative for anybody who wants to reach out and talk to them about figuring out how to put farmers in touch with people by just building a store to fill that need. Great, thanks, Nicholas. You know, I see the clock, and as as often, we 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 run out of time. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank our presenters today. So much appreciation uh, for Sarah and Megan and Lindsay and Liz and, um, and Ben. Really appreciate your uh, presentations today and the participation of everybody. Uh, really uh, excellent conversation. We record these and put them up on our, uh, on VT Rural's uh, website. So please, if there's others you think would be interested, feel free to share them. Our next uh, session is two weeks from now and it's a skill session around how do we build participation in our um, in meetings and local events that we hold. So uh, two weeks from today, uh, that should be a good session. And just one request to you all, you know, we're gonna build another round of workshops for um, uh, I guess maybe later in 2020 and into 2021 and really looking for your suggestions and advice for what we should be covering here. We really want this uh, network to be um, almost led by its members in terms of where we focus our work. So really feel free to email me. I'm john at vtrural.org uh, and be in touch with your suggestions and ideas for, for how you feel like um, where we should focus our work as, as we move forward. Uh, again, just a tremendous appreciation for all the leadership that you all are showing in your communities. We really, um, uh, you know, frankly, what you do is the backbone of who we are as a state here in Vermont. So uh, thank you so much uh, for all of your work. Thank you, everyone.